So it is a brief view of a complex subject. Uh, respiratory neurophysiology as a whole is uh, uh, a whole branch of respiration control systems. I wanted to put a picture up of the respiratory muscles here to emphasize the fact that what we're dealing with with the lungs encased in this rib cage with musculature, uh, with a diaphragm muscle at the bottom of it, uh, that this is a complicated three-dimensional structure. And the muscles are distributed uh, over the periphery of this. And so we must account for the geometry uh, and the fact that we have to make the timing correct so that the motor neurons provide the stimulus to contract these muscles uh, in a simultaneous manner so that we uh, we don't have one part trying to contract while the other is not so it needs to be coordinated in a very complicated way part of that is handled i think in the medulla but part is also handled in the upper cervical cord, uh, as we'll show you in a moment. So that's a picture, a nice picture of the muscles, uh, the intercostals, internal and external, and some of the uh, muscles that sometimes help you with excessive breathing, like the scalenes and so forth. The main uh, muscle for Respiration is, of course, the diaphragm. And sometimes when we are exercising, we will want to have an active expiration rather than a passive expiration. We usually have at rest. And that will involve the abdominal muscles uh, trying to compress and move air out of the lungs. So here's the picture that we looked at here in the introductory lecture. Uh, it is from this this paper by Galley, which uh, part of which some sections are put to read. There are a lot of other papers. Uh, back in 2004, uh, I did a review of the functional organizations and some of the questions and speculations. Richter and Smith put together a very nice uh, review here. Uh, Detail Richter is the uh, person that invented, if you like, the idea that we have a three-phase rhythm of respiration, not just a two-phase of inspiration and expiration. Uh, and um, Jeff Smith, um, who with Jack Feldman uh, introduced the idea, as we'll see, uh, later of a uh, Betzinger complex that itself generates the respiratory rhythm. And we'll go into the fact that we have two schools of thought of pacemaker or uh, a single place where rhythm is generated versus a network interactions. Um, this uh, Paper is also rather a very good review if you are looking for a review. And if you're looking for the uh, respiratory central rhythm generators throughout various vertebrates, then uh, Bill Milsom has provided an excellent review, uh, which is extremely current as well. So we're looking uh, at um, next week, the central chemo receptors is pictured here in the retro trapezoid nucleus. Uh, the Betzinger complex, which I think I told you is named after an Austrian winery, um, is located roughly in this position here and under it we call the pre-Betzinger complex. And that is thought by some to generate the respiratory rhythm that gets everything going. The rostral part of the ventral respiratory group, ventral because it's on close to the ventral surface, as you'll see, uh, and the caudal part of it uh, is mostly expiratory. Uh, the rostral part is mostly inspiratory motor neurons.
he's drawn in some of the facts of, of the connections here, uh, but in actual fact, the connections probably uh, go cross the cord about this uh, point and, and descend the spinal cord so that, as we'll see uh, from rat experiments, um, there's bilateral control from one side. So mostly uh, expiratory pre-motor neurons, we would call these because they are sending their axons down to activate motor neurons in the spinal cord. So pre-motor neurons here. Um, and what's not shown here is there is a group um, that is close to the dorsal surface uh, and the nucleus tractus solitarius, uh, which is the input for vagal and glossopharyngeal um, messages from the carotid body and the lungs. Uh, and that is known as the dorsal or DRG, dorsal respiratory group. Uh, here we have something that uh, Janusz Lipski and I studied in both cats and rats, and it's the upper cervical inspiratory neurons. We still are not quite sure what they do. They certainly relay a, uh, an inspiratory drive down to the motor neurons in the spinal cord. But whether they are involved in what you might call sort of long spinal reflexes, so that we can control this this complicated muscle container of the lungs and make them all synchronize together. They may be involved in that kind of thing as well. And down in the spinal cord, um, uh, in uh, the, the uh, phrenic nucleus here, uh, with its axons going out to the muscles. And here is a recording of the phrenic nerve discharge. If we integrate it, we get an idea that this is how the lung volume will change. It ramps up and then suddenly stops and pauses for a while before the next inspiration begins. So that's uh, a good overview uh, of the entire control system there that operates the respiratory muscles via the motor neurons in the spinal cord. So let's look a little further. We've got um, the upper cervical inspiratory neurons. I put a reference into there. And here's an excellent review on the spinal and respiratory motor neurons and interneurons, because there's a lot going on in the spinal cord itself to organize uh, and synchronize the drive to all of these muscles as pictured very nicely uh, in this diagram here. So uh, locations of the respiratory muscles and it does the spinal levels that innervate them. And so we have um, the premotor neurons up in the brainstem, they're going to have very long axons that go down to the various uh, motor neuron pools here. In uh, the very early days, uh, when the kind of experiments that could be done uh, were mostly uh, on uh, uh, animals where you could uh, anesthetize them, and then you could uh, perhaps ablate or uh, take away uh, a certain section of brain and see what happens to the respiratory rhythm. Uh, that was an ablation experiment. Or you could put a rather crude stimulus electrode in there and stimulate and see what happens to respiratory rhythm that you would uh, uh, observe. And then the other thing that you could do is you could transect uh, at various levels, starting rostrally and then moving caudally. And all this gave rise to the nomenclature that you see here, that we think we have a pneumotaxic center that somehow um, controls our rhythm. We have an apneustic center, which is if you stimulate that, you get a very long inspiration. And some kind of inspiratory center uh, and some kind of expiratory center that interacts with each other. But with such crude, uh, experimental procedures, it really doesn't tell you very much 
But that's how the whole thing started. That's what I looked at when I started in the 1960s to look about how respiratory rhythm was generated. Now, in 1965, Batsell introduced the idea that you can make microelectro recordings of the extracellular potentials, and you can record these to provide uh, a much better description of what activity is going on in the brainstem that might generate respiratory rhythm. Um, so the descriptions that we've reviewed so far have been using these electrophysiological techniques as well as anatomical tracing uh, and recording uh, extracellular and intracellular potentials with microelectrodes. And we'll talk about some of the preparations that were used here. Here is a very rather faint picture, but you can see that there are, uh, there is a respiratory rhythm. There is a burst of activity here, which then uh, is not shown and will repeat. But this is the kind of uh, recording that one could make. In those days, the uh, only way you could make a recording that would show action potentials is to use a photosensitive paper. Uh, and uh, these were rather complicated and expensive um, recorders. Uh, we uh, have no such difficulty these days. We just hook it into the computer. Now, some of the that's the electrophysiological idea uh, of using microelectrodes to record. Uh, there are anatomical methods, and here's a very uh, beautiful illustration from my good friend Janusz Lipski, whereby they have injected a dye intracellularly, and they've used two kinds of dyes. Uh, one is uh, given in yellow here, it's not the actual color, but it's false colored. And the other was into a phrenic motor neuron here, uh, shown in green. So this is in a neuron uh, up in the medulla. Here's the recording of its bursting pattern. Here's the recording of the phrenic nerve bursting pattern. And you can see it's synchronous. Uh, and here's the intracellular potential recording uh, right here in miniature. And so we can see that the cell here has a lot of dendrites. It's collecting information from quite a few different places. And it has an axon that splits. And it has dendrites going over into the opposite side. This is a picture of the uh, slice of brain here. And it's going to the opposite side, uh, probably uh, to interact with uh, respiratory neurons on the other side of the medulla. And then it has a descending axon. And it goes very, very close to the ventral surface. So you can see how... Um, an injury to the spinal cord um, might uh, might damage uh, these axons. One is going to um, the upper cervical inspiratory neurons, probably. Uh, one is going at C4 uh, to the phrenic motor neuron here. And if you can wait long enough, because it takes a long time for the dye in injected intracellularly to travel down, um, retrograde down the axon to get to here. So obviously it didn't have time to go into the dendritic fields that would be down here in T1 for the thoracic motor neurons. But that tells you uh, very graphically how these neurons look in the medulla that are sending the respiratory rhythm down to the uh, interneurons, the upper cervical, and to the motor neurons in the spinal cord and the thoracic cord. So how do we find um, the respiratory neuron locations and connections? Well, recently, uh, we come into techniques uh, that are reviewed in this paper here uh, that uh, is highlighted. Uh, 
and there are quite a few different uh, tools that permit experimental manipulation of the neural neuronal activity. You'll notice that this is a much more sophisticated way than putting a, a large stimulating electrode into where you think a group of neurons might be, because you can direct this uh, stimulation or an inhibition to a specific set of uh, neurons that have a specific um, uh, receptors on there that you that you know about. And these tools use the light and peptides and small molecules, and they activate the ion channels and G protein couple of receptors that will activate or inhibit neuronal firing. And so by looking at the, the electrophysiological recordings of things like the phrenic nerve, other nerves and behavioral effects, we can understand the links between brain activity and behavior. And there are two classes of this technology. Um, first, it uh, is a designer um, G couple protein stimulators. Uh, they manipulate that protein signal transduction pathways. Receptors activating only by uh, designer, designer receptors exclusively acted by designer drugs. So not only do you uh, set a specific uh, set of cells with characteristics and put into those a receptor that you have designed that is not, uh, not um, intrinsic, but it is activated by a drug, a designed drug. And these are the dreads. Designer receptors exclusively activated by a designer drug. That's what that stands for. And so that is uh, about the best you can do to localize a stimulus or uh, an inhibition that uh, in cells that you have already identified uh, by their uh, receptor characteristics. The other thing you can do is you can get uh, um, light gated receptors, opsins, channel ro rhodopsin here, halo rhodopsin, um, that you can get um, various cells, target cells to express, and they respond to light to alter the cell membrane potential. And so they can hyperpolarize or depolarize, or in other words, uh, they can um, uh, inhibit or activate these neurons. And you can make these respond by the pattern of light that you put onto them into a specific pattern of neuronal firing that you need, not just like these with dreads, turn them on or off, um, but you can actually control their pattern of fire. And that is optogenetics. Let's take a look uh, at some examples. So this is the chemogenetic approach. And uh, this group has considered that one of the pathologies of OSA is linked to uh, the control of the pharynx and the upper airway patency fails because the hypoglossal motor neurons are not driving and activating these muscles and keeping their tone up and they go flaccid uh, and that way they relax and you get an obstruction and that's obstructive sleep apnea. So what they did is they uh, took their dread and their control virus, uh, administered it to a, the hypoglossal nucleus, uh, let it be there for six weeks so that it can be incorporated into the hypoglossal motor neurons. And then you, you have uh, the activating, and, and that was the, the CNO clozapine N oxide, CNO. So in the treated mice, 
uh, that designer drug activated the genioglossal muscles. You could see that it dilated the pharynx, whereas saline uh, had uh, no effect at all. So, um, and control virus as well. So they thought that maybe this is a way that might be considered, considered as a treatment option for OSA and other motor disorders. And here, here is the paper that describes it. Here is a picture. This is a slice of the brain, as you can see here up in the medulla. And you can see we've got the hypoglossal motor neurons lit up here. And here's a diagram of where that where they are. And um, you can do this stereotactically so you know exactly where you are. Here's a recording of the electromyogram and an integration of the electromyogram and, and a measure of the respiratory effort. And you can see that here's the baseline. And here, when you put in the CNO, you definitely you've got a tonic increase uh, and uh, the level of tone has has increased overall. These are the respiratory efforts. So this is the respiratory rhythm, but you'll notice we've raised the baseline tone here so that they are total, more, much more active. And here's the, the result over here. So that's how you use dreads. What about the optogenetic approach? So um, you, you virus encode the opsin in the brain to the gene of interest that targets a specific cell type. And they targeted the glycinergic pre-Betzinger complex neurons in mice. Um, and they used channel rhodopsin and they, that was expressed so that now here we have the experiment here uh, in the retrotrapezoid nucleus we have an infected unit, it will respond to pulsed laser light. And what does it do? We will see if it changes phrenic nerve discharge by electro recording of that as it goes down to the diagram. And you can see here's the phrenic nerve discharge here. And as we turn the laser on, my goodness, it certainly does activate. And the, the, the rhythm is, is uh, much more apparent. Here's where they are. Um, and it was the RTN neurons that expressed um, uh, the, the uh, gen optogenetic target. So there's there's the three weeks following the injection. This is from P Patrice Guionnet, who's a very important author, uh, as we'll see when we consider the retrotrapezoid nucleus and the central chemo receptors. So these are two very new to me techniques that I feel that you should know and realize that they are there. So when you read about it, you know, ah, yes, I, I understand um, in a general way as to how they work. You don't have to go into um, uh, a great deal of uh, detail unless you're very interested in that. But you can understand now when somebody said, ah, we used optogenetics to stimulate, you say, yes. I, I, I realize that that could be done. We go back to the electrophysiological approach. And uh, I, I put in this statement here. Uh, will the remote control of neural sig signaling provide the necessary information that will tell us how respiratory rhythm is generated? If you go back to the old, old days and you think about the pneumotaxic and apneustic center, this is simply a much more sophisticated way of applying a specific stimulus or uh, inhibition to a specific known group of cells and then seeing how the whole system works. Is that going to really help you? 
um, in some ways, I'm sure it will. But much of the information that we know about rhythm generation and its transmission to the motor neurons in the spinal cord, we've got that from electrophysiological experiments over the years, and they use several preparations, and here is one of them. Um, I think one of the things that's happened uh, over the years is that we've moved away from these electrophysiological experiments because they are extremely time consuming uh, and extremely difficult to do. And these more modern methods uh, are uh, in a way uh, easier to manage in a laboratory. You don't have to start your day at 7.30 in the morning and then go home at 3.30 the next morning on the uh, late running TTC. So here's one of them. Uh, it's an in vivo preparation, the decerebrate rat. In other words, you remove the brain. You, you take a rat and anesthetize it. And while it's anesthetized, you take the brain away. So now you can um, uh, don't have to maintain the anesthetic. You have an unanesthetized preparation which will be generating a respiratory rhythm in the brain stem. You can measure that in the hypoglossal nerve or in actually in the tongue by putting electrodes in. And you can see measured by recording the phrenic nerve. All this involves quite complicated surgery. You have to be very good at it. Um, and uh, we did it uh, for many years in my laboratory. Here's the kind of thing that you can get up. This is uh, an experiment that uh, John Pieber and Wokong Tian did in my laboratory. Um, uh, and uh, it, uh, John, John is uh, now an expert in, in sleep and a professor at U of T. Uh, Guofeng is now in uh, Rochester as a professor there. So what have we got here? We've got a recording of the left phrenic nerve. Um, and uh, the right phrenic nerve. So we have both phrenic nerves. And now what we have done is we have transected the medulla right down the center of the medulla. So we've split the medulla into two halves. And here we have the left phrenic after and the right phrenic after. And you can see that these rhythms are very different. They were synchronized before, they are not synchronized after. And here's the diagram that will tell you um, how you could, uh, why we could see that. Because the phrenic premotor neurons up in the medulla have uh, axons that descend both the same side, the ipsilateral side, and the contralateral side of the spinal cord. And so when you transect, you cut the connection between the two, and now each side generates an independent res a respiratory rhythm independent of the other side. But because they have their ipsilateral connections, we can still see that when we record from the phrenic neurons here. So that's something that is important to know. The respiratory rhythm is generated independently on both sides of the medulla. These connections change uh, from the neonate rat to the adult rat. In the adult rat, the phrenic premotor neurons shown here in orange, they project bilaterally to the target neurons. Uh, in the neonate, they only uh, project contralaterally. So if you cut those, the phrenic motor neurons stop firing. And so we've looked at experiments like this to detect what kind of connections there are. In the neonate, we certainly know um, that the premotor neurons are acted by, activated by a common input here, probably the central key receptors, I would say. And uh, they, they also 
have connections to each other, which are drawn in here. So this axon bifurcates here, uh, excites its uh, contralateral neighbor, and also descends the spinal cord to the friendly motor neurons. Uh, and again, that's uh, the how the bilateral synchronization of the respiratory motor neuron in rats, adult versus neonatal, uh, and that's in vitro preparations, which we'll learn about. So uh, the connections to um, the phrenic motor neurons may well change uh, from the neonate uh, to the adult. Uh, whether this occurs in uh, humans, we don't know, but we've used rat as a model and uh, suggest that it probably does. Here's another preparation that one can use. This is a brainstem spinal cord preparation from uh, a neonate that one extracts from the anesthetized neonate and puts into a dish and perfuses that dish with uh, well oxygenated uh, uh, mock cerebrospinal fluid. And then you have all of the nerves that you can record from. And if you record from the phrenic nerve, you see that it does have a rhythm. It's not a very regular rhythm, and it's not a, a ramping burst. And some people have said, ah, this is simply uh, gasping. Because when you consider that the neurons generating this and sending uh, its uh, drive down the spinal cord are buried in the tissue here. And the only way the oxygen is getting to that tissue is through the tissue from the fluid that you've highly oxygenated around it. So these are liable to be very hypoxic, if not almost anoxic. And so some people have said, right, you may have recorded a, a, a rhythm from here, but this is not the normal respiratory rhythm. This is a gasping response uh, that comes in uh, during a hypoxic emergency as a fail safe, the last resort to keep an animal or you breathing when you are extremely hypoxic. From this, you can derive a slice which contains enough uh, of respiratory neurons that have a rhythm like this uh, in the pre-Betzinger and Betzinger complex. And so the pre-Betzinger complex here is supposed to generate a respiratory rhythm. How can you record it? Well, you can record it from hypoglossal nerves because they are within the same slice. And so again, you see that this one looks like a reasonable rhythm, but it's very slow. Um, even though I haven't shown the time scale, I can tell you that it is slow. And it is again, a, a sort of reverse ramp. It is decrementing in its firing frequency and, and the, uh, the actual potential heights are falling too. So again, it has this kind of gasping rhythm. However, this is what Jeffrey Smith and Jack Feldman um, studied and presented uh, as a big surprise to the world in 1988 to say that, ah, respiratory rhythm is not generated by a network of neurons, it's generated by this kernel here uh, of the pre-Betzinger complex. We have studied uh, the uh, Lin Lin Chen uh, and John Pieper and myself studied these neurons to see what connections they might have. And uh, we have found recordings and again this decrementing firing pattern. And we did both sides and we did a cross correlation of these action potentials. And one of the things we found, a cross correlation uh, tells you that uh, uh, after the firing of a neuron on this side, the firing on the other side increases uh, somewhat uh, after a certain time. And if you go backwards, uh, 
uh, it tells you that the firing on this neuron, uh, uh, sorry, the firing on this neuron is uh, also firing uh, previously to, to itself because it's receiving uh, an activation from the other side. So these activities, there is a mutual uh, excitation here. That is probably something that is going to be acting to uh, synchronize both sides of the medulla. So these are the kind of cross connections that one can find uh, looking even in the slice into the pre-Betzinger complex, the supposed kernel of respiratory rhythm generation. Now, my good friend Julian Payton, uh, working in Detail Richter's lab, came up with this preparation. Uh, whereby um, you can, uh, it's called the in situ uh, uh, or the working heart brainstem preparation, because you have decerebrated here and removed uh, most of everything um, below the diaphragm uh, and certainly uh, above the, and the cerebrum is gone. And if you cannulate and perfuse the descending aorta and you perfuse it with an oxygenated artificial CSF, uh, then the heart and the distribution of the arteries works to keep the brainstem perfused and alive. And you can observe the phrenic nerve discharge here and lo and behold, it is a ramping discharge, which is very much like you would observe in the intact preparation. And so this looks much more like uh, the in vivo, uh, the normal respiratory rhythm. But you now have access um, to for various drugs uh, via uh, the uh, solution which is being pumped around here uh, with a roller pump and a pruset reservoir which is bubbled with carbogen and you also uh, have now got uh, a good look you don't have to uh, do complicated surgery you can put microelectrodes now into the, the brain stem to record respiratory neurons so this is a, a fantastic preparation so we come to respiratory rhythm generation. H how was it done? The original ideas were that it was um, a property of a neural network. It was mutual inhibition. In, in the 1960s, uh, there were uh, two groups of neurons, inspiratory and expiratory, and they inhibited each other uh, by mutual inhibition connections so that as one turned off, it turned off the other, and then the other turned on and turned off the on. So inspiration and expiration then flipped back and forth. Um, if you think about that, it really doesn't work. And if you model it, it doesn't work uh, because you simply get stuck in one side or the other. It's stuck in inspiration or it's stuck in expiration. And then the idea of the kernel or pacemaker came out in 1988 by uh, Smith and uh, Feldman and Feldman's lab. And the conflict therefore came into place at various conferences between those that uh, thought, no, it's not this pacemaker idea, that's simply a gasping rhythm, uh, but the real rhythm is generated by uh, the uh, various neural network of connections. Um, and even now it's modified itself into, ah, it's a series of coupled oscillators perhaps. However, this is reviewed if you want to go over this uh, relatively recent paper um, in, in this uh, paper here in Nature Reviews Neuroscience. So, my idea is that we are still not really sure how respiratory rhythm is generated. 
And many of the current theories and mathematical models that have been done uh, incorporate both aspects of it. So respiratory rhythm generation, how, how can we find out how it's generated? Well, we would like to start by classifying the respiratory neurons. Uh, we can classify them according to and identify them, uh, put labels on them by la location. They're in the rostral, lateral, ventral medulla. Uh, they're in the VRG, the DRG, ventral respiratory group, dorsal respiratory group. Uh, what is their pattern activity? Do they uh, discharge a ramp of activity during inspiration? Uh, what about during expiration? What about during immediately after inspiration has occurred, but not fully into expiration? That would be a post-inspiratory uh, pattern of activity. And finally, what is the function? What connections do they have? Uh, do they connect to other neurons and inhibit them or excite them? And so we look uh, at uh, electrophysiological experiments to see uh, how, how we might find out. Here's um, my picture of the medulla and uh, spinal cord and what's going on. Uh, and I give you a, a cross section here to show you uh, in the rostral, ventral, lateral medulla. Here's the Betzinger complex. And then there's the pre-Betzinger complex, complex here. The Betzinger complex contains some very important uh, expiratory neurons that are inhibitory to practically every other respiratory neuron in the medulla and even phrenic motor neurons. They are in the Betzinger complex. And they were discovered anatomically at first and thought to be excitatory, but then when people looked at how they functioned, they found that they were inhibitory. And we'll see uh, some of uh, how they're connected uh, in the next few slides. So there's the pre-Betzinger complex, the rostral ventral respiratory group, mostly inspiratory, caudal, mostly expiratory, uh, the upper cervical inspiratory neurons, and then phrenic uh, motor neurons and internal and external intercostal motor neurons. And, and here is why we call it uh, the ventral respiratory group. It's down here. It's next to the nucleus ambiguous. Um, which contains neurons which are, um, have a respiratory rhythm, um, but they are not part of the rhythm generator and they don't uh, send axons down the spinal cord. Here's the nucleus tractus solitarius uh, and, and here's the uh, hypoglossal nucleus. And this is the dorsal respiratory group uh, right into the nucleus tractus solitarius and it sends um, axons uh, around the medulla and down the spinal cord and we think of it as acting as a receiving uh, station um, for what's coming into the nucleus tractus solitarius from the vagal nerves and the glossopharyngeal nerves. So from the carotid chemoreceptors uh, and the bifurcation in the neck uh, and from uh, receptors in the lungs, stretch receptors, irritant receptors, etc., which we will talk about. So they act to receive those and then distribute um, the the messages, the signals, um, depending on what they what they should be doing in terms of the various activities like inhibition and excitation, and they distribute these around. Uh, to the ventral respiratory group and indeed to both sides of the medulla. So here's a, another picture uh, of way uh, of looking at them and the organization Betzinger complex, nucleus ambiguous, and the ventral respiratory group. Here's the pre-Betzinger complex where the rhythm is supposed to be generated. Uh, and here's the retrotrapezoid or parafacial respiratory group. And here's the dorsal respiratory group here. It's just a, a sagittal slice instead. You'll notice that uh, dorsal is 
up here. So this is the ventral surface. And that's that's a picture out of Galley's paper that you've probably seen. If you look uh, out of this paper from the Japanese group uh, with uh, Onomaru and Okada, uh, Onomaru is the chap, uh, his, his lab is the one that invented the, the whole uh, of the um, brainstem spinal cord uh, from a neonate in a dish. And, and they, they operate, uh, they present their cases with uh, upside down compared with what we're used to. So the ventral surface is on top and the dorsal surface is on the bottom. But again, they, they show you roughly where these various neurons uh, that we talked about for generating and controlling respiratory rhythm, where they reside in the medulla. And here's my effort of doing so too, and to tell you what kind of recordings that you might get. The, the blue is the phrenic nerve, as you can see, and down here in the caudal part of the res ventral respiratory group, you get these expiratory neurons that fire a ramp of uh, activity during expiration. Here in the rostral part of the ventral respiratory group, you find the inspiratory neurons. And these will be premotor neurons that send these signals down the spinal cord. Um, these, these, these go to, the, um, to excite the expiratory motor neurons. These excite the inspiratory motor neurons, as you can see from the phrenic. And then there's this rather interesting neuron here that fires a brief burst uh, right after the phrenic nerve has stopped. And it is up there in the Betzinger, pre-Betzinger area. And we call this a decrementing firing pattern. And you can see already in your mind's eye, hmm, maybe this has something to do with the fact that it fires and ooh, it stops the phrenic nerve. Is this part of the rhythm generator? Well, you'd be on the right track if you thought so. And here's um, the patterns of activities that we put into our uh, little review here. Um, Kazuhisa Azura and Janusz Lipski and I uh, got together at a conference and decided we would put all of these in. So here's the inspiratory augmenting. So this is the pattern that we call IOG. It, it occurs during the phrenic ramp with the phrenic shown here. Here is a decrementing inspiratory neuron that fires during inspiration. So it's inspiration and it's decrementing. You can see the, the bursting pattern falls, uh, the rhythm, uh, the frequency of firing falls off as the inspiration proceeds. Uh, here, I, I call your attention to this post-inspiratory period, whereby, yes, most of the phrenic nerve has stopped, and, and it more or less stops immediately here, but then, then there's some activity that, that persists and fades away, and even over here, it's even better. You can see a complete stop and then a, a, a ramping down of activity. What's that for? Well, if you think in terms of breathing, you've taken in an inspiration and the air is now being distributed by this three-dimensional network um, of airways to various parts of the lung. And those different uh, parts of the lung will have different compliances, different uh, elasticity, if you like, and therefore will fill more easily or not more easily uh, varying over regions of the lung. And so in order to um, get the distribution of the inspired air uh, more uniform, it is nice to be able to sort of hold the lungs at a, a little volume to, in other words, to retard the expiration. And that's what this does. And in, in uh, any of you that uh, employ ventilators, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about because you can do this with your ventilator.
and it helps to distribute the air and therefore to operate the lungs better for oxygenation. So that is the eye deck neuron there. So what does that do for rhythm generation? Here is a continuous firing. It's, it's probably a neuron that is, is uh, just uh, sending the signal proportion, it's firing uh, frequency proportional to perhaps the central key receptor drive. Now here in the expiratory period, this is an expiratory neuron for E, it's augmenting firing pattern and it lies within the Betziger complex. And as I said before, we now know that this is an inhibitory neuron and it fires starting at the very beginning of expiration, uh, ramping up towards the end and then suddenly stopping. Now here's our decrementing neuron in the expiratory period and its firing pattern looks, looks very much like it corresponds with this firing of the uh, phrenic nerve here. So it is an expiratory neuron decrementing firing pattern. And here is one uh, fairly rare hard to find, um, that is uh, fires just at the transition. So is this something, it's a burst IE neuron, burst inspiratory, expiratory neuron, is that responsible for actually turning everything off? So there's the kind of thing that you can look at in terms of patterns of activity and think about, hmm, how might these be involved in generating a respiratory rhythm in a network? And you can go over and classify them and, and not looking at the actual recordings, but saying this is this is a, a model of, of how they look. Now, this is work uh, done from uh, Azura's lab, and uh, it is painstaking, difficult work. Uh, and I, I wish people were still doing this because it tells you an awful lot. And he's looked at the inspiratory neurons uh, in parts of the ventral respiratory group up into the Betzinger and the dorsal respiratory group. And he says, OK, I, I can find these and I can find where their axons going. Here is an inspiratory augmenting neuron in the rostral part of the ventral respiratory group. It has an axon that goes over, crosses over, excites neurons over here in the opposite ventral respiratory group and then has an axon that descends the spinal cord to activate probably phrenic etc motor neurons in the spinal cord here's a motor neuron uh, that simply leaves and activates probably the muscles of the upper airway here's a continuous one here uh, that probably feed back and, and activates some of the neurons surrounding it. Uh, when we look now at the expiratory neurons that we find here, uh, we can find expiratory motor neurons there that leave uh, the medulla immediately for activating airways, etc. And we find in the caudal ventral respiratory group, we find uh, expiratory bursting neurons that send their axons down the spinal cord. And these are excitatory to the expiratory motor neurons in the spinal cord. Now up here we have the expiratory uh, augmenting and expiratory decrementing neurons. The expiratory augmenting neurons, these are the Betzinger expiratory neurons that are inhibitory. They are inhibitory to not only probably their own side of the medulla neurons, but also over to themselves and to other parts of the rostral, uh, ventral respiratory group and the dorsal respiratory group in, in this rostral uh, region here, uh, and also in the caudal region. So they inhibit everything. And they, they keep inspiration from, from uh, going. And they also have descending axons down the spinal cord where they will inhibit phrenic neurons. And we'll, we'll show you that in a moment or two. So these are extremely important um, projections uh, that we need to know in order to find out how. This is how the motor neurons in the spinal cord 
uh, cord are controlled from the medulla. These are the neurons that do it. When we look for uh, the expiratory augmenting neurons in more detail, we can see here it has inhibitory protections back on to its own location, onto the motor neurons here that are exiting. Also, the rostral ventral respiratory group in spiratory neurons, it inhibits those, it inhibits the dorsal respiratory group, all of the end and the rostral uh, caudal respiratory group uh, in the ventral uh, medulla here. Um, so all of the ipsilateral, the same side, lots of inhibition, plus it sends another branch over here and does the same thing on the other side. So the tremendous force of inhibition coming from this group of expiratory vesicular neurons now, if we look for the decrementing firing pattern of the expiratory neurons up here in the Betzinger complex, we find that they too have extensive collateral projections down to at least the rostral uh, vent, uh, part of the ventral respiratory group. Not sure whether they go into the dorsal respiratory group on the same side. And they have projections to the contralateral side, again, to where they live in the ventricular complex, into the rostral ventral respiratory group, the inspiratory neurons, inhibiting those, also inhibiting the neurons in the dorsal respiratory group, and also down into the expiratory neurons in the ventral respiratory group. So this gives you an idea that there are extremely powerful cells that uh, are, lie in the Betzinger complex that will control the rest of the medullary respiratory neurons as far as inhibition goes. This will provide an inhibition that grows during the expiratory period. This will provide an inhibition that starts immediately uh, at a high rate of firing, a high inhibition at the beginning of expiration and then fades away. And here also we find the inspiratory decrementing neurons. These two are found up in, in the region near the Betzinger complex, just down south there in the pre-Betzinger complex. And they have inhibitory connections. They have a decrementing firing pattern. They probably have projections to the ipsilateral uh, respiratory neurons, but they certainly have inhibitory projections all over the rostral, uh, sorry, the co uh, contralateral part uh, of both the rostral and caudal ventral respiratory group, as well as the dorsal respiratory group, as well as to uh, expiratory neurons in the Betzinger complex too. So that's very important. From the same site, we can find the expiratory neurons that are continuous. This is probably the site of the retrotrapezoid nucleus and the central chemoreceptor. But at the, at the time, uh, 1990, we didn't know about that. And they have excitatory connections, probably uh, on the same side, if lateral, and probably, uh, and certainly on the contralateral shown uh, here, in all regions of the respiratory neurons that have axons uh, driving down the spinal cord. So all of the pre-motor neurons are inhibited by the idex and excited by the continuous, which is probably the central chemoreceptors. receptors. So that gives you a very good picture of what might make up uh, a pattern generator, a control of respiratory rhythm uh, by all of these networked uh, con connections. So we can we can get an idea of the function of a neuron. Uh, in other words, how did they how did they know uh, 
uh, that they these neurons were inhibitory or excitatory. Um, and uh, we can find out, are they inhibitory? Are they excitatory? Are they part of the rhythm generator? That's difficult to know. Uh, do they shape the burst? Are they just afferent relay neurons that are relaying uh, vagus and glossopharyngeal information? Uh, and are they neurons with axons descending spinal cord? So they are the premotor, driving motor neurons in the spinal cord. So here's um, some complicated uh, recordings that can be um, interpreted uh, to show what the functions might be of uh, these neuron patterns we've been looking at. Uh, trace one is the membrane potential of a phrenic motor neuron. And you can see it uh, depolarizes and fires. And then uh, during the expiratory period here, it uh, fades, its firing fades away. You can see the phrenic nerve is recorded down the bottom. That gives you an idea which phases are which. And we call them inspiratory and either E1 or E2. And sometimes the E1 is called the post-inspiratory phase. That was the term that uh, Detail Richter used. So trace two is from a ventral respiratory group, uh, inspiratory augmenting neuron. And so uh, we infer by looking at this uh, that this is probably providing the excitation. It's bulbospinal. We know, in other words, bulbospinal means that it has an axon descending the spinal cord. We, we know that it probably is exciting and providing the drive to this phrenic motor neuron during inspiration. But what's happening uh, during uh, expiration. How can we find out what's going on there? Because it seems that there's a, um, a hyperpolarization here. Well, if you inject chloride into intracellularly, you can reverse the resting potential so that now in, in inhibitory um, transmitters will now produce a depolarization. So you can reveal the fact that there is an inhibition coming in here at the end of expiration. Where could that come from? Well, it could certainly come from a Betzinger complex E augmenting neuron. Um, and, and that may well be where it comes from. And so there are the various traces. You infer that the ventral in, in uh, group in spiritually augmenting neuron excites phrenic motor neurons. And from from these traces, you refer that the Betzinger E augmenting neuron inhibits phrenic motor neurons. Note it's note we identify as the Betzinger uh, because it's uh, up there, it's it's inhibitory. If you were talking about an E augmenting neuron in the caudal ventral respiratory group, that is an excitatory to expiratory motor neurons. And so that's how we can infer connections from intracellular recordings like these. We've made some other in inferences from other recordings uh, by other means and demonstrated these connections that we've inferred from that diagram. Well, cross-correlation of left and right phrenic nerves shows that they are simultaneously activated. So I've, so both of them have an increase in their firing uh, at a time roughly zero. It's slightly off because uh, there's a transmission delay um, from one side of the spinal cord to the other. These is milliseconds here, very short. Uh, so we know that they have excitatory connections from the medulla that uh, excite both left and right neurons at once. So that means that the transmission from the medulla is going to both sides, it's descending axons ipsilateral as well as descending contralateral. 
So what about averaging the phrenic motor neuron intracellular potential? And this time we trigger that average at time zero and then look to see what the potential was. We trigger it uh, to record the intracellular potential and we average it over 2000 sweeps from this Betzinger complex E augmenting neuron. That's an inhibitory postsynaptic potential right here. So we know that Betzinger expiratory neuron actually goes down the spinal cord and inhibits phrenic motor neuron there. Here's some cross correlation experiments of left and right phrenic nerves with the activity of a ventral respiratory group inspiratory augmenting neurons. And it shows here's, here's left and right um, phrenic nerve uh, cross correlations. Uh, both the left and the right are excited after the transmission delay down the spinal cord. So that's why it's uh, just a few milliseconds uh, uh, delayed from zero. So that ventral inspiratory augmenting neuron excites both left and right phrenic neuron, motor neurons. And I know that. It's taken several hours and a very complicated uh, uh, surgical preparation of, of a of a rat to do this, but I am sure of this information. Here's some more inferred connections. Here I have an intracellular recording of a ventral respiratory group inspiratory augmenting neuron, and you can see it depolarizes and, and, and uh, it, it's uh, going to fire action potentials down the spinal cord here. And the, it, if we reverse that potential, as I described before by injecting chloride, we can see that the potential here uh, is, uh, is from this IDEC neuron here, which is firing at this point, that corresponds. And so we can say, ah, this IDEC neuron in the rostral ventral lateral medulla inhibits that ventral respiratory group inspiratory augmenting neuron. So we know we can infer that. Here's trace three here. They, that's the membrane potential with the reverse. Trace four is a Betzinger expiratory augmenting neural activity right there. And trace five is a ventral uh, rostral ventral lateral medulla expiratory decrementing neuron. You can see decrementing firing pattern. And you can see that that corresponds here. And this corresponds to this. And so we conclude, we infer the connection by looking at the membrane potential that both the Betzinger expiratory augmenting and the EDEC neuron in the rostral ventral lateral medulla. These neurons both inhibit the ventral respiratory group inspiratory augmenting neuron. So you can see this is uh, the demonstration or the proof, if you like, of those connections that we showed you from that Azura showed in his diagrams. And we can more or less prove what's happening here to cross correlation between two uh, ventral respiratory group inspiratory augmenting neuron shows that they are both activated. There's a central peak here uh, echoed out in, in peaks either side too. Uh, they're activated from a common source of excitation. Both of them receive excitation simultaneously. Where does that come from? Probably the central key receptors. We can also average the intracellular potential and trigger that average by another ventral respiratory group inspiratory augmenting neuron. And that too shows that they're both activated from a common source of excitation. Because if you trigger the membrane potential by uh, the action potential of another ventral respiratory group neuron, and, and, it, and it occurs, brings you a peak uh, of intracellular potential at the same time, yes, they are commonly activated. 
And then if you average this in spiritually augmenting neuron in the ventral respiratory group, and the, if you average the intracellular potential and you trigger the average by, again, our, our famous Betzinger E augmenting neuron, it shows an IPSP again. That ventral respiratory group in spiritually augmenting neuron is definitely inhibited by the Betzinger E aug neuron. So these these are the proofs, if you like, and the way the kind of experiments you would do to uh, convince yourself that the diagrams of Azura are correct. Here's the last of these inferred uh, connections. I realize they're quite complicated. Um, and the membrane potential of a Betzinger complex expiratory augmenting neuron. So the, the famous inspiratory, uh, expiratory neurons of the Betzinger complex that inhibit everything. And the IDEC neuron is recorded here. And uh, if you look at the reverse trace, you can see that it corresponds quite beautifully. So we would infer that that IDEC neuron inhibits that Betzinger expiratory augmenting neuron. And down here, we can do the same kind of thing and, and look at what's happening to the membrane potential. When we look at an EDEC, ooh, there's a decrementing effect of it here. Uh, and what about the Betzinger complex E augmenting neuron? Another one of it, it's, its fellows here. What about that? When does it occur? And look, the firing corresponds very well with what's changing in the membrane potential here. And so we can infer the inhibitory connections to that Betzinger E augmenting neuron for both the EDEC and its fellow E augmenting neurons. So there's inhibitory interconnections between the, these inhibitory neuron population. If we can demonstrate with cross correlation, here we have a cross correlation between a Betzinger E of neuron and a stimulus that activates another Betzinger E of neuron. Uh, and we can stimulate that other Betzinger EOG neuron by stimulating its axon in the spinal cord. And we know that that uh, is this, the axon um, by various other tests, which are even more complicated to explain. So there are inhibitor, and that's an, uh, that's an inhibition here in, in the uh, cross correlogram. So we know that there are actual inhibitory connections between Betzinger complex E augmenting neurons. That's why these are so important. And if you cross correlate to the firing pattern of two Betzinger E augmenting neurons, they inhibit each other. There's mutual inhibition, another demonstration. There's inhibitory on both sides. That means one in they each inhibit each other. So how does that work into making models of a network of respiratory rhythm generation? And these are simplistic model, not complicated uh, computer models that uh, some people have done. Um, if we just look at what connections we know, um, here is uh, Dieter Richter's model. He thinks in terms of three phases and has uh, a mutual inhibition between IDEC and EDEC neurons. This is not known to exist, um, and therefore it's dotted. Um, what is known to exist, as we've just shown you, is that there is uh, a mutual inhibition between the EOM neuron in the Betzinger complex and the IDEC neuron shown by these. And the same thing goes for the EDEC neuron. So that and the, these, of course, inhibit the ventral respiratory group and respiratory augmenting neurons, as do these. And that generates a respiratory rhythm that operates the phrenic motor neurons. Now, Azura thought that, hmm, 
you, you, you probably can do it quite simply from a mutual inhibition between IDEC and EDEC. Uh, and, and these, of course, inhibit the uh, Betzinger E augmenting neurons, which inhibit the BRG, and the IDEC and EDEC also inhibit here. And that's the way the respiratory rhythm is generated. And then I came along and thought, hmm, uh, I would like to make a model that works um, with the known connections and, and never mind having, having to postulate that these connections shown as dotted lines exist. And so I said, what about mutual inhibition between the Betzinger E augmenting neurons and IDEC neurons? We've just shown that. And sure enough, it works as an oscillator. And one of the factors that uh, changes the, the way that a mutual inhibition oscillator works from the original ideas that we have a group of inspiratory neurons and a group of expiratory neurons, mutual inhibition, well, they simply stop in one phase or the other and they don't oscillate. Well, you can make you, it oscillates in this case because this is an IDEC neuron. It turns itself off. It has an intrinsic mechanism which starts the firing very rapidly at first and then it declines. And so it turns itself off and therefore enabling the E augmenting neurons which are being driven probably from the uh, central Q receptors, etc. And so these uh, can now turn on, turn this off, uh, and so forth. And so if you do a computer model of this, which I, I did, a very simple one, it does work. It does oscillate. But there are much more complicated models out there if you wish. And some of them uh, look like this. So that there are all kinds of uh, uh, inhibitory and excitatory connections proposed connections down the spinal cord and what's happening in the lungs, uh, receptors in the lungs, mechanical feedback. So this is from Galley's picture here. So you should know that there are a ton of very complex network models. This is not the only one there. And here we, we showed this before where we were looking at the uh, volumetric mapping of activity um, potentials uh, from Matthias Deutschmann's lab and Ted Dick and company. And uh, so they put in a, an array of electrodes which looked at uh, the uh, potentials that they could record to see what the activity was during respiratory rhythm in the, med in the medullary areas. And um, I think, whoops, does this? Oh, I don't think, this, does this work? Oh, unfortunately this, hmm. I thought it should have worked, but it doesn't work. Uh, I'm sorry about that. You've seen it before, uh, thank goodness. But then you could see that, um, uh, entire areas light up, especially during this uh, period when we stop inspiration and start expiration, the changeover from inspiration to expiration. However, I, I still wonder whether uh, the, these kind of experiments are going to show you how rhythm is generated because you're looking at the activity of all the respiratory neurons, some of which are going to be involved in generating the rhythm, but many others are going to be involved in sending that rhythm down the spinal cord to activate the motor neurons of the phrenic and intercostal muscles. So the final words. Uh, one final word comes from Jeffrey Smith. Um, who is one of the discoverers of the pre-Betzinger respiratory pacemaker in Jack Pellman's lab, as I mentioned previously. And as he says, a central issue is the role of intrinsic pacemaking capabilities that some respiratory neurons exhibit. So yes, they do, 
have their own pacemaking capabilities in these neurons. Uh, but they have used simulations and dynamic system analysis to show that once a conditional respiratory pacemaker can be tuned across oscillatory and non-oscillatory dynamic regimes in isolation, once you put that in a respiratory network, its dynamics become masked. In other words, it's the network that takes over, I think. And from the same folks that uh, showed you the, the previous slide uh, of the uh, recordings of the activity throughout the medulla, our data also suggests that an excitation inhibition balance of respiratory network synaptic interactions is what critically determines the network dynamics that make the respiratory rhythm and pattern generation. So I remain uh, a, a fan of a network of respiratory rhythm generator, but I am also convinced that we really haven't defined it well enough yet. <laughs>